as far as the used car space, I think it's going to be very, very, very long before I'm getting I'm getting EVs. And that's why he, he said he's going to have to just stand on the side of the road with a with a sign that buy one Nissan get one free something. They got they got to do something to to, to get rid of these cars. Well, well, the thing about it too, the consumers that I'm talking about the the uh, the the ones that I ain't right. driving no robot car. If I title it Ford can't sell EVs, which they can't, that's a true statement. But if I title it that. It will never get viewed because people just see, oh, there's EV title. I'm out. And I know that you can work in a cyber truck and it would it would be fine. But I mean, these good old boys, they don't they ain't driving no robot truck. And I'm finding this out firsthand because of the videos that I make. And I cover the car market. EVs right. are a part of the car market, but I can't title and thumbnail something with with EV in it. It will not get watched. And and people in the comments, do not hear what I'm not saying. I've driven <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Know it all his Model Y. I loved it. It was fantastic. <laughs> I like Teslas. I I I don't own one, but there's probably going to be a day at some point that I will own a Tesla, right? Or some EV equivalent, whatever. So I I'm not a Tesla. <laughs> this I am. <laughs> no, it's not going to be that one. That one's ugly. Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know it all. Guess who is with me again? It's Brandon from Car Questions Answered. I am so happy to have you back on the channel. It's been a while. Uh, I think we flip flopped. Like, I think you were a fairly new channel when I had you on originally. I'll, I'll post a link to that, by the way, in the description and, and some cool videos of yours. But we have completely flip flopped. You've got like a, a 200,000 subscribers now, something like that on your YouTube channel. Yeah, it's we're at 200 there and we've got 30, I think 32,000 on our second channel now. But yeah, yeah, I was uh, very appreciative when you brought me on the first time because I was tiny, tiny, tiny. And uh, I think uh, having uh, doing interviews with you and we had a couple other channels that asked us to come on that that really helped us in the beginning. So I really appreciate that. Cool. Yeah. And and for those who don't know who've been living under a rock, uh, you talk about the car market in general. So obviously Tesla is a you know little piece of the broader car market. And uh, it's really, I actually want to start with the used car market right now, because that's what your day job is, is, is running a used car um, sales, uh, retail sales place. And uh, I've seen in recent videos, of course, that you all have pretty much sold out because it's tax time and the relatively low cost cars just go flying out the door when people get their tax checks. So, so what, what is the condition? I don't know. You're the, you're the guy with the boots on the ground here. So let's just, we'll start small and we'll zoom out. But like for you personally, what do you think this year has been like 2024 tax season as opposed to 23, 22, 20, you know, going back in time? Yeah. So just a little back in uh, to preface this, this. Um, so I'm, I have a used car lot. Um, I'm a car dealer. Uh, the cars that we specialize in are around $5,000 and under. So I am the very low, low end of the market. Uh, but uh, our end of the market is very volatile because there's not a lot of cars uh, in the market in that price range, obviously. So we have to scratch and dig and try to find whatever we can to be able to service our customers in that, uh, in that, realm of, realm of things as far as uh, what what they can buy what they can't buy uh, we don't do any lending um, so we uh, we see really basically the customers at the at the bottom of the economy that's who we that's who we like to serve that's uh, that's that's our niche uh, in in this market but what we're seeing right now is we just came out of um, tax season uh, spring selling season and we're really supposed to be in the middle of it right now but we're seeing it really shrink this year. And, um, I think okay. it's, uh, due to that there's, there's less tax money out there than, uh, than what we've been accustomed to. Now we hit it hard, but, uh, I really feel like the reason why we hit it hard is because of the price range that we're in. So we have, um, usually cars anywhere from, I mean, $2,000, $2,500 up to about 15,000, even up into $20,000 usually get a big bump, a big hit during this time of year. But uh, what we've seen happen is that a lot of dealers that are in that $5,000 and over range, $5,000 to $15,000, they're not selling as well as this year. And it's, it's, it's very weird because usually, just like me, they hit it very hard. And what I feel like has happened since we've done well and other car dealers aren't doing as well is because um, the market has kind of shifted from that middle tier. They're having to... Right go down to the bottom tier, which allows a car dealership like mine to do very well, while these middle tier car dealerships are not. And I really think that's a big factor of inflation. But even bigger than that, it's going to be your your lending. So a lot of people will generally get their tax refunds back. They'll have that two to $5,000 they'll get back for families. 
Um, right. And they'll be able to go put a down payment down on one of these $15,000 cars and then start their car payments. But we're finding that this year, because lending has gotten tighter, because interest rates are as high as they are, um, because the market's just where it is, banks are tightening. And a lot of those people that want to get into these loans, they're not able to. So that's pushing more consumers to cash deals. And they can't they can't scrape up eight thousand dollars. Most Americans don't even have five hundred dollars in their bank account, but they right. can they can scratch up twenty five hundred, thirty five hundred dollars uh, dollars for for a car, and that's that's where I thrive. So so in the in the market, we're seeing that my range of cars they they are they are going up a little bit, but not as much as we would have anticipated, and that's because spring selling season is, is weaker, and this it's just the factor of demand is going down in the car market right now. And uh, and we're we we got a tough run of things uh, coming up because right. uh, there's a lot of car dealers that anticipated a really good spring selling season, a really good tax season, and it's not coming to fruition. So that's that's where I'm looking uh, forward uh, from from here on out that we continue this downtrend in the car market that what we've seen over the last six months, I think it's going to continue. I really loved taking French in high school and even used it recently in Vancouver, Canada, but I've always wanted to learn Spanish too, as I spend far more time in Spanish-speaking countries than I do in French-speaking ones. Well, for the past few months, I've been taking care of that by using today's sponsor, Babbel, to teach me Latin American Spanish. Babbel is scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in three weeks, which is great for me as I like results quickly. Plus, Babbel teaches you real-world conversational skills, something practical you can use with people in your life who speak the language or make you feel comfortable doing daily tasks in a country you're traveling in. And that comfort can make all the difference as you can have practical conversations about travel, business, relationships, food, and more. Me llamo Sabina. Me llamo Sabina. Ellas se llaman Ana y Eva. Ellas se llaman Ana y Eva. ¿Cómo te llamas? ¿Cómo te llamas? Be sure to check out my link in the description to get 60% off your subscription during their spring sale. But hurry, time is limited. Babbel is a fantastic way to learn a new language with lessons designed by real language teachers. Plus, with Babbel, you get two free live classes with your subscription and a 20-day money-back guarantee. So you can try Babbel risk-free and find out how easy it is to learn a new language. Thanks again to Babbel for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link in the description to get 60% off your subscription during their spring sale. And now let's get back to it. So that's actually really interesting. There's there's several things to unpack here. Number one, I, I saw a recent video of yours where you basically have sold out your lot. We've got about 20 that are uh, we still have to either work on or get them cleaned up or whatever ones that we bought recently. But uh, we're I mean, you see on that hill up there. We're, I mean, we're out. We have, we have nothing, nothing left. And, and that's great for you. I mean, obviously if that's the market you're after and you're selling so that, but, but it sounds like you're actually attracting some customers who would normally go to the next tier up the 5,000 to $15,000 car. Um, but I, it makes me wonder, like, is the, is the reason for this just that people aren't getting as much taxes back because interests are higher. And so therefore, like, if I'm going to try to do an, let's say a $10,000 car and I can only put 5,000 down. And it, even if I can get a loan, if the loan is like 15 or 18 percent interest, that might be that might look like a terrible monthly payment. And so I might be like, oh, I'm just going to go for a car that I can just pay cash out and just just do it. Is that part of it? Or do you think it's literally that that it, you can't even get a loan at that right price range? I think it's more of that. The banks have tightened so much that they're okay. kicking those customers out of the pool um, because customers. For, for the most part in America here, that they, they don't care about the interest rate. They don't care right. about how much the car even costs. What they care about is the monthly payment. Can I make that monthly payment? And if they can get into that monthly payment that they think they can afford, they'll buy the car. It doesn't matter how much it, it right. costs. And that's what we've seen happen over the last three years where dealers could charge these insane amounts uh, for these cars. But it, the consumer didn't care. They're, they look, okay, mm -hmm. I can make this car payment. I got money coming in right now. So I'll buy it. And that's one of the big right. problems that we had. And now the banks are, we're seeing record high delinquencies. We're seeing, I mean, I'm seeing stuff in the, in the credit card market too, where we're seeing tons and tons of delinquencies coming through the, the system. We're seeing more repos and the banks that, I mean, they have to cover themselves and the way that they cover right. themselves is by tightening up and by not going that sub, sub, sub prime route anymore. 
those customers are going to get kicked out. And uh, that's that's what we're seeing right now. And I don't think it's a factor of interest rates. I don't think the average consumer cares about the interest rate. I think right. they care about the monthly payment and will the bank give me this loan? Yeah, yeah. And obviously, if you can't get the loan, then whatever you got cash on hand is what you have to buy. Yeah, that's, that's it. So, And uh, that's why they come buy a $3,500 car. Right, right. Yep. Uh, which, you know, which has its own there's a downside to that because normally those kinds of cars are kind of towards the end of their lives and, and and you're going to end up probably having to put a lot more money into it over time. I mean, I'm sure you sell quality cars and it's fine for a period, but six months, a year from now, something's going to go out the oil pump, <laughs> transmission, something, and that's going to suck. So yeah, so it's it's difficult, uh, you know, purchasing at that range. Uh, what do you see on the opposite end? Because like, like, you know, you're like, my lot is sold out. And obviously, you're very strategic about this. And you don't buy cars, because there's also bump it at auction to purchase used cars at this time, because everyone's selling and they're like, Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we have all this money. And so prices go up. So you kind of wait it out. But do you see a lack of cars coming into the system now too, since you sell in the used car market? So here's the problem with the used car market and how it ties to the new car market. So we talked about banks tightening up, we talked about interest rates, right. we talked about the lending. So how a used car dealer like myself is able to get inventory on the from these used car dealer auctions is from dealer trade-ins. And mm -hmm. so when you have your 2005 Toyota Camry, it's got 175,000 miles, you're like, okay, there's nothing wrong with this car, but I'm ready to upgrade. You go to the new Toyota dealership, you buy your new Camry, and you trade in your old Camry. That, that franchise dealership, that new car dealership, they don't want that. 2000 whatever Toyota Camry with 175,000 miles on their dealership. So what they do, they send it to a car dealer auction and that's where I buy my cars from. So here's, here's the problem and why that ties into the, from the new car side to the used car side, these new car dealers right now, they're not selling a lot of cars. The demand is way down. We're seeing that from incentive spin from these manufacturers. They know that they have to do something right now to get butts and seats because they're not selling vehicles. But where that ties into me is that if they're not selling cars, they're not getting trade-ins. If they're not right. getting trade-ins, they don't have anything to send to auctions. Auctions are still half of what they were four years ago. So there's still a big uh, just supply drain. Drains the wrong word, but there's a right. there's a big uh, there's a big hole of where all these trade-ins are not there at these uh, dealer uh, car auctions. And that's uh, that's cutting down on what we can buy. So used car prices cannot go down in a significant way until we get supply. But we can't get supply right. until new car dealers start selling cars. And new car dealers are not going to be selling cars at these prices, at these monthly payments. We're the highest monthly payments we've ever seen in the car market right now. Right. Inflation's right. high. People cannot afford to buy a brand new car, so they're not going to. So they're not going to trade in their old cars. That means I can't get them. That means used car prices are going to stay high for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And, and that's really, really tough on everyone. And 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 that also, again, you know, if you're looking at if you're looking at getting the best bang for the buck in, in a used car market, no matter what the, the price range, but like if you're like, if I would normally have gone to your lot to purchase a four thousand forty five hundred dollar car kind of at the maximum range that you're at suddenly that same car might be $6,500. And so it goes to the other, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the, the uh, whatever that other uh, retailer is that's out there selling used cars. And then they're in a hurting situation too, because that person's like, well, that's way too expensive for what the value I'm getting for that particular vehicle is. So it hurts all around. And, and obviously I just, I can only tell you anecdotally, but I know you do more specifically, but like when I drive down the kind of car dealer row here in Athens, it was empty in 2021, 2022, and now it's just packed. There's just cars everywhere. Yeah. There's a CarMax down the road where I sold my, my Tesla last fall, and I felt like I kind of got a steal because they gave me what I thought was way too much money, but at the time, it was just at the end of that kind of bubble where they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you like $35,000 for this car. <laughs> I was like, okay, guys, take it. Uh, but you know, but but now their lot is just completely full, so they just like everybody's just packed to the gills with all of these vehicles. It doesn't seem like that's going to lead to anything good at this point, but I, in terms of like for the consumers too, because, you know, we need to buy cars. Like at some point, everybody who needs to be able to drive to work has got to buy a car. 
So, yeah, it's yeah. interesting that you pull up CarMax. It's a good example because CarMax is just a glorified buy here, pay here dealer. And right. when I say buy here, pay here, I mean they hold their own notes. They write their own loans. You can go in and buy a car from CarMax, and they're literally going to give you that loan. So they deal with a right. lot more subprime. Um, and subprime is what uh, is uh, that, that's who that's who buys cars during the spring selling season. And you can go to a CarMax just about anywhere. You're saying near you, you're seeing the, the CarMax was filled up. So CarMax does the same thing that we do. And we load up for spring selling season. We load up for uh, for tax time. And when CarMax does that, um, then they're putting out a bunch of capital that they're expecting to get a return on. But but if there's not so much money in the system there uh, from the, the tax refunds, and they're not able to sell through a lot of uh, the inventory that they've loaded up with, well, then you have a big problem for a company like, like CarMax because you have this downtrend that's uh, going to happen in the market. And instead of getting this, this big spike that they're expecting and selling through a lot of this inventory, now they have inventory just sitting there rotting away. And also they're going to have to eventually lower their prices by 10%. See if it sells. Another 10% see if it sells, which is all well and good in a small dealership like mine. If it's only 100 right. cars, 10% is not that much money but they've got tons and tons and tons of cars all across the country. So if you have a car market that takes a big hit, like after tax season when prices are going to fall off a cliff because right. there's just no money in the system and people who were going to buy a used vehicle, they probably bought it when they got their tax refund checks. Um, right. So we go through a dry spell at the beginning of summer, even on my car lot with the prices that we have, we'll, right. we'll be dead after the money's gone. And CarMax, they're going to have to lower the prices of the cars that they didn't sell. So they're they're very uh, they're very tied to the volatility of the market, and especially in the market right uh, that we have right now, when supply is still low on the used car side. Um, right. Then th right. they're going to be susceptible to to a lot of losses, a lot of paper losses, um, as far as the inventory that they have and that they keep and don't sell during this time frame. Right, and and I think we can talk about that too. That that there's there's just been a chain of really really bad things happening because the first. Obviously, COVID messed stuff up, and then there was a the supply chain shortage, and then we got the interest rate hit. So it was kind of like a triple whammy. So it, it's not like it's just a bubble of inventory right now. It's This has been building since like 2020. Uh, it's just this consistent build of, of bad things happening. And I, I have to think, um, I know that, you, you know, again, because you've talked about it, that you're you're fairly smart about this and you don't have a floor plan or in other words, a credit line where, where you're purchasing cars on credit, but pretty much every uh, new car dealership and probably most used car dealerships do have a line of credit with some bank or something like that. And I get it's correct. It's called a floor plan, right? That's what the that yep, line of floor plan. Yeah. And so, so it's, it becomes even worse because then the bank is sitting there holding the note. And so let's, let's say you've got a hundred cars in your lot and you only sell 10 of them. And then the, the, the note for interest comes up and you're like, uh Oh, <laughs> you know, cause then it's like, well, now I got to start paying interest on these vehicles that are just sitting in my lot doing nothing for me. So that, that becomes a really significant problem for dealerships. Yeah. And what the way a lot of these floor plan companies get their capital back to is after a car goes through a time period where it doesn't sell in 60 or 90 days, not only does that dealership owe the, um, and I'm talking about for, for smaller used car dealers, not only does that dealership owe the interest that has accrued on that car, but they a lot of times have to pay 25% or 50% of the loan at that given time. And a lot of times this is money that these uh, these dealerships did not have to begin with. That's why they're using these credit lines. So right. if they go through a time period where, okay, they have a 50 car lot um, and they only sell, I mean, they could go through a time period where they only sell 10, 20 cars in a 60, 90 day period, especially if it gets slow, then on the rest of those cars, they have to come up with 25, 50% of the loan value to keep their floor plans current. And what I like to say a lot is uh, if uh, these dealerships that don't have the money that are living basically paycheck to paycheck, uh, car sell to car sell, um, if they get into a predicament where, okay, the market dries up, where it looks like that's probably going to be the case over the summer, then a lot of them are going to get their floor plans decreased greatly or or lose, lose their floor plans. And if they don't right. have that available credit and they can't buy inventory, I like to say it a lot. If you can't buy inventory, then you can't sell any cars. If you can't sell any cars, you can't make any money. If you can't make any money, then why are you even in business? So I feel yeah. like over the summer, we're going to see a lot, especially uh, smaller used car dealers, 
um, that aren't prepared for this, we're probably going to see quite a few of them go out of business. Right. So this is pretty rough right now. If, if you were if you were a used car dealer in particular, and you're looking at this and you're like, yeah, we're going to sell a bunch of cars during tax season. And it's like, well, there's only there's one month literally from today for the end of tax season. But most people who get big refunds get them early. So they've probably gotten yeah. them by now. And if you haven't sold now, you're not going to sell in end of April, May, June like that. It's going to be really dead. So you're a, you, you can see the writing on the wall probably at this point, And that's got to be a bad day. Yeah, let me let me give you an example. So in in a ten day span, we we had uh, let's see here, we had a hundred, I think one hundred and six cars at our at the peak this year, but right. in ten days we sold sixty four cars. Wow! Oh and that was that How was about do that. That's like so much it's like work. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, that was that was it started about three weeks ago. Okay, and yesterday was a bright sunny day, no weather problems or anything like that. We have I think. 20 cars available for sale left and right. we were dead. We sold zero cars. So wow. it literally happens that fast where we get this massive rush. It happens. It lasts for about two weeks. And then as fast as the money gets here, it's gone just like that. That's what right. happens every single year. And if you don't get that first big hit, if you're priced too high, when that first money comes in and another dealer gets your sale, gets that money that you were supposed right. to get, you're out of luck. And then you yep. are scrambling and at this, at this period of time right now, you're going to see a lot of dealers start to scramble. Right. And, and I know you probably don't follow the Chinese market that much and I don't either, but last year, 2023, I, I believe I saw that something like 2000 uh, car dealerships went out of business last year in China. So, you know, there, it's not just a U.S. centric problem. This is a global problem that clearly is, is having a massive effect on, on, uh, on transportation itself, because, you know, again, it's like whether we want to or not, we pretty much all have to have cars to get around. It's you can't bike 10 miles each way to work on a highway. It's just not going to work. You know, you got it. You got to have a car or else you're taking Uber and the Uber is a car. And so somebody's got to drive that car. So so somewhere if we need the transportation. It's really important. So I, I guess just to, to push it up, I want to talk about Tesla in just a second. But let's go one level higher to the car dealership, the car manufacturers, not the dealerships. Um, so, you know, the Ford, the GM, the Toyota, et cetera. What um, what sort of I don't know. What do you see? I know you don't have as direct of an interaction with them. But if all the car dealerships are full up right now, they're full to the gills and they have to start turning down their allocations and go like, we just don't literally don't have more room on the lot to pull, pull these things. And I know that usually the strings that uh, manufacturers pull is they're like, if you don't take the allocation and you don't take the crap cars that, you know, nobody wants right now, we won't give you a good allocation next time around. And so that's the way they, they, you know, kind of leverage that. But the issue is now that nobody can take it. At least it seems like it. Nobody's selling cars. Ours. So, you know, what, what do the manufacturers do at this point? So I just had the privilege of interviewing a Nissan, um, a, a Nissan franchise manager. And uh, oh, okay. that video we're, I mean, we're, we're posting today. I know your viewers yeah. are going to see this uh, later on, but it, yeah. it will be posted I'll by the time. I'll link to it. Whoops. I'll put a link to it down here underneath. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so I did this and what he said is that, um, okay, he, about two and a half months ago, he had 50 new cars for sale. Okay. He was about to get a shipment of 70 more cars and wow. he already had up to, I think 120 cars. So he was going from 50 new cars on his lot. And then two and a half months later, he's going to have over 200 cars, 200 new cars on his lot. That's how quickly it has changed in this market. Right. And uh, what he was saying that uh, that needs to happen is they need help from the manufacturers. Now, right. he is a dealership. The reason why I went and interviewed him is because they're even through all this craziness, even through the pandemic, everything. They never sold any cars over MSRP. They never wow. had dealer wow. markups, wow. dealer adjustments, yeah. nitrogen. They didn't charge any of that stuff. They're a good dealership. I really like <laughs> I know that. that's your favorite gas in the world. Is that nitrogen? I hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> um, anyway, so even a dealership like that is having a hard time moving vehicles. Um, so what we just saw come out of Nissan just, I think, two days ago was that uh, for every Murano that a dealership is selling, Nissan's given that dealership thousand dollars so this is what you'll see more out of the manufacturers these are the levers that they're able to pull they have special interest rates they have rebates incentives those kind of things to help dealerships be more negotiable to be able to lower prices the problem the problem is and this is one of the frustrations that this uh, nissan franchise manager uh told me is that okay there there are vehicles out here i gotta get i gotta get rid of 
because they got to come out from my floor plan. I, I got to get rid of them. They've been here too long. But he wanted to sell them for less than invoice, and he can do that, oh. but he can't advertise that. Okay. And that's and that's coming down from Nissan. So even if these franchise right. managers are in a pickle and they have to get rid of these cars, even to take a loss on them, they can't advertise them for only so much. So really their their hands are tied. And if you're going online and looking for these cars and you want to get a really good deal, you're not going to be able to see the real price, even if that franchise manager is at a good dealership and they want to advertise it for exactly what they want to sell it for. The manufacturers right. will not allow them to do that. Interesting. So if the invoice on the car just say was $35,000, that's what they bought it from Nissan from. They they cannot advertise it for less than that, even if they intend to sell it for like 32000 or something, if they want to take a hit on yep. it. Wow, that really yep. does put them in a bad situation then. Because because you if you can't advertise, then you can't then people won't know. And if they don't know, then they're not going to come there and buy it. So um, is, is that why sometimes, I mean, I've looked at cars, you know, just I browse sometimes. And sometimes you get one of those like online things where it's like, you know, click here and contact the manager to find out what the price is. Is that like probably one of those kind of situations? Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, what he said that he can do is he can put, okay, clearance sale. He can put uh manager special on the car, whatever. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. now this is, this is, this is Nissan. So every manufacturer mm -hmm. is going to be different, but right. I think most of them are like, <clears throat> you can't, you're not going to be able to advertise under MSRP. That's going to be standard across yep. most of them. And, uh, so it's uh it's that's that's definitely it's going to be different through each each uh, manufacturer, but th that's why he, he said he's going to have to just stand on the side of the road with the uh, with the sign that buy one Nissan get one free something they got they got to do something to 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 get rid of these cars. Wow, wow. What I mean, his lot size is probably around two hundred cars. So I mean, two hundred is just completely maxed out full kind of thing. Yeah, or? they can probably put two hundred on their front end because but they had cars stored in the back too. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, 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 you know, at, that's what I, again, that's what I noticed when I drive down the road and I'm just like, this place looks, it was empty two years ago or even like a yep. year ago. And now they're just, they're just stuffed. Um, yeah. And one, one more thing about that. He was yeah. uh, talking about, you're talking about allocations earlier. So right. um, they were, they were begging Nissan six months ago to try to get cars. He needed versus, he needed $20,000 versus mm -hmm. because they could mm -hmm. sell them as soon as they got them on their right. lot. Right. And now he said he's got 23 verses on his lot and he can't sell them. That's how quickly it changed. But wow. now Nissan, he was begging for cars from Nissan six months ago. Now Nissan's right. basically begging him to take the cars. Right. So it's kind of like he got awarded these cars for selling them six months ago. But now it's kind of like a double-edged sword because right. that award of these vehicles is now a burden for a lot of these right. dealers. And it's, it's flipped just so quickly. Wow, it's crazy. All right, so so uh, we can I think we can bring Tesla into this conversation now because of prices and stuff. I, I think one thing you know every day, like if you follow the Tesla world, it's like oh my gosh, there's a Tesla price cut. All these things is like terrible. I, I think one thing that people don't realize is especially with well with with used cars too, but with new cars, the, there are price cuts constantly. Like what you were saying was incentives, lower interest rates. Uh, you know, cash back from from the manufacturer and all this stuff. So effectively, what they do is they just kind of use the dealership as a buffer where they can say like, okay, if we're selling a car for thirty five thousand and it's not selling, we'll give people some rebates and things like that, and effectively knock the price down to thirty two, and, and then it was it's going to have a higher chance of selling. So, um, so that's one thing. But but certainly there's been I, well, you wanted actually before we started recording, you asked me that question, you know, about the the Tesla stock, and it's. It's in the tank. It's in the crapper. There's no other way to put it. Right. And and I think one of the reasons why is because we're seeing Tesla uh, is is being relatively flat in their sales too. And so you know Tesla was like a rocket ship for a while, and and they were really really blasting through and kind of ignoring a lot of the economic headwinds. But you know Elon Musk and other people at Tesla were like, look, it's going to be a rough 2024. They they told us it was going to be tough, and and clearly it's that way like across the board. Everybody is having a hard time, including uh, Tesla. And they're, in terms of electric vehicle manufacturers outside of China, they're like by far the best in terms of being able to sell through. But man, when you look at like 
uh, when you look at like Ford or something like that, or or Toyota doesn't even sell EVs or, or Volkswagen. I don't have a local Volkswagen dealership. No, no Toyota they, does have an EV. It's just yes. garbage. Yeah. That's garbage. yeah. They, they've yeah. sold about five of them. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there you go. But, but, you know, it's just, it's brutal right now, especially if you're a, not a Tesla, because if you look at like the Ford lot, I, I went there and I know you've done that recently. You did a, a video on that, the Ford F-150 Lightning, that you couldn't get one of those what a year ago 18 months at the most but now there's just like i can go down and there's just like about six of them on my local it's just a local you know it's not that big of a ford dealership and there's six ford f-150 lightning sitting there it's like in a row it's like damn <laughs> they're just they're just waiting to be sold uh so so what do you think you know in terms of the ev market specifically do you have any insight i know eventually you know eventually things are going to trickle down so that they're you're going to be selling some sort of used ev for five thousand dollars at some point in the future but not yet i'm assuming like you haven't gotten those in no no it'll be yeah. so i can as far as the used car space i think it's going to be very 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 long before i'm getting i'm getting evs and the problem is so the evs that we we see go through auction right now are going to be older. They're these Nissan Leafs. And by the time that they get to auction, we had one the other day that I put, uh, put in a video. It only had 18,000 miles, but right. the, it, the battery wouldn't charge fully. So, I mean, you, yeah. you charge it and then it's going to go 20 miles and then yeah. you have to find a charger. And so nobody's, nobody's going to buy that car. Right. And by the time you go in, you have to, you have to service the battery, put a battery in, it's probably not worth what you could actually sell the car for. So, um, so that's the experience that I'm having on the used car side of things. Even right. if you're talking about not, obviously there's not going to be a $5,000 EV out there. That's going to make it onto my lot. But right. even I'm talking to the guys that are, that on middle range are selling cars for 15, $20,000. They're not touching yeah. EVs. So it's just okay. the market for a used EV is not there and it's not going to be there for a very long time until we get a big enough sample size to have evs move through the the used car market and have some longevity of the batteries actually having right. some miles on them and then the, the biggest thing for me is the is the is the charging capabilities i know there's a lot of people out there that say well you just charge them at home at night but a lot of people who are buying used cars they're not maybe um, as affluent as the Tesla right. customer is going to be. So they live in apartments. They live in places where they don't have garages. And there's not a lot of people that are going to feel comfortable just running a cord out to their right. out to the road in front of their house to be able to charge their car. And that's going to be the yeah. problem, getting EVs into the use space and having uh, people in that uh, segment of, of our, of our um, economy to be able to, to buy them. That's the, right. that's the hurdle that we have to get over. Yeah. And, and of course, it was it was very different. I, I don't know exactly when the moment was, but at, le at least like a year ago or something. It was very different because you couldn't get a new EV. No matter if you wanted to buy an F-150 Lightning, you couldn't get it. So the used market was effectively pr propped up by that because people were like, well, I can't get a new one. I'll buy a used one with 20,000, 30,000 miles on it still and probably pay just about as much money as I would for a new one. But now with oversupply and prices being cut, that means that the used cars either have to be sold for very little money or they're they're very not worth it. And it is a little different than a gas engine. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely grant you that. It's like, uh, and, and it's all the battery. It, it's like the motor and everything is going to run for freaking ever, right? That thing's probably going to last longer than you know the age of the universe or something. But but the batteries are a big concern, and I think you're right about the sample size. I feel fairly comfortable buying a car new like this, an EV, and selling it one time. I feel like, you know, you can sell it once at 50, 100, 150,000 miles, whatever that is, that you'll probably be able to sell it one time. And especially with the newer cars, with the better battery technology, et cetera. But it's that thing where it's like you're more than likely not buying a first used car sale at $5,000. I mean, you're probably at least two owners, maybe three, right? Somebody bought it new for, say, 35 or something like that. Then they sold it for 20. Then they sold it again for 10. And so you're, you're kind of in that realm. And with a battery that's pretty risky at that point when you got 175,000 miles and three owners and you're like, Oh, is this car not going to like charge up? And um, that seems to be that that would be a major concern to me as, as a purchaser of a used car. Well, the problem that arises in my head now, I'm not, I'm not in the EV space. I'm not you. I'm not uh, Farzad. I'm not okay. Tesla bull. That, that's not me. Right. So right. my, 
And I, I would assume that a ma- from what we're seeing from the numbers, a majority of the country probably falls a little bit more in my camp than like you and Farzad, as far as uh, the understanding right. of how EVs work, the comfortability, uh, being comfortable having an EV, but uh, most people who are going to buy a five thousand to fifteen thousand dollar used vehicle, they can only have one car. That's all they yep. have. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be very difficult for them to own one vehicle and it for it to be a Tesla, and for them to feel comfortable going on a road trip or something. Because if they want to go on a long trip in the middle of the country and have to try to find charging stations. It's probably not something they're going to be comfortable with where they know that they can find a gas station anywhere. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a good point too. I think it, like we, we had the good fortune that we have two cars in the family. And so we could purchase a Tesla and we could try it out essentially. And we had the gas car as a fallback in case it didn't work. Now we ended up loving it so much that we ended up buying two Teslas, but, 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 um, I can certainly understand being very conservative if you're like, this is the car I've got. It cannot fail on me. <laughs> and if it does fail, I need to be able to take it to the local service center and have them fix it in a couple of days, you know, so that I can get back to work. It, it just it can't go out. Um, and, and so that that matters. I, I think the, the, the charging thing is unfortunately a, I think that's a perception problem more than a reality problem because I've put a lot of miles on these cars and it's really not an issue in terms of charging. Now that's very specific to Tesla, but with other companies like again, Ford, GM, et cetera, getting the NACS charging port starting this year, that's not going to be such an issue with them either. It's it's basically like, you know, there's, if there were no gas stations, it would be pretty damn scary to drive, <laughs> you know, to drive your gas car wherever it was, if there was no gas stations around. And, 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 but with the EVs, obviously, until the infrastructure gets built out enough that people are pretty comfortable with it, if you're on that conservative end and you're like, this is the only car I got, it's got to be able to do whatever I need it to do, I can understand why people would be a little bit hesitant to buy an electric car as that as your only car. Right. And, and, and hear me out. Everybody in the comments, I know I, I, you're going to say, OK, there's there's a charging station every 300 miles, whatever you're going to say. I don't understand how it, how it how it works and that you can you can get to. I, I get that completely. And I know that you can make a road trip and you can plan it out. Tesla, the, the car does it. I've been in Dr. Know-it-all's Tesla. It tells me exactly where the charging station. I know this. Right. I know that it'd be fine to to have that as your only vehicle. What I'm saying is the perception of most yep. Americans is not that. I know that you can have it as your only car, right. but Tesla does not do a good enough job educating Americans, uh, consumers to know that they can have that as their only car. And this is one of the big problems. If you want this, this adoption across the market of EVs, you got to educate people. And the problem right. with, with educating people on a product, it costs a lot of money. It costs a yeah. lot of money. And yeah. uh, and so before you blow me up in the comments, I understand. I understand you can go on a road trip in a Tesla and it's absolutely fine. But but most people do not know that. Right. And that's going to be something, a hurdle that Tesla's going to have to overcome. Yeah. And, and, and to be very, very, um, to be fair about this, if you don't get a Tesla, I have heard many people who bought, I don't know, you name it, a, a Volkswagen ID3 or ID4 or something like that, or a Ford, and including, I think Jim Farley went on a road trip with his Ford F-150 Lightning with his kids, and they couldn't get charging, they had problems, they, they didn't have the right, you know, and he was, I think that was kind of the moment because it was pretty soon after that, that they actually signed the deal with Tesla to get on their charging network. Because yep. it's like, it's true, it would be the same thing as owning a gas car and it had some sort of weird like thing, you know, that you couldn't plug a standard gas like, you know, uh, uh, pump into and you could only go to very specific gas stations. You'd be like, I don't know if I want to buy this car. You know, that's, that seems kind of sketchy. Or it's not going to be your only car. If you can only yeah. go to specific yeah. things, there's not going to be a consumer out there that's going to be like, right. OK, let me let me get a Tesla. This is going to be my only car and right. I have no backup. And also, also on top of I have no backup, I have no money. So if yeah. I want that car to get me to work every day, I have to know that I can trust it to be able to fill it up with a charge. And I don't know where the nearest charging station is. And that's yeah. that's yeah. that's something that that a lot of consumers are are faced with. And and I especially in the market of people who are less affluent and not having access to a garage or a, a power, you know, because if you're living in an apartment complex. 
I don't know if your apartment manager is going to like, like that little orange thing snaking down from your apartment out to your car. You know, they're probably gonna be like, no, you can't do that. And that means that you, you end up in a weird situation because one of the conveniences of an electric car is I drive it home at night. I plug it in. It's, it's full in the morning. I don't, I don't, I don't ever think about it. Right. So unless I'm going on a road trip, I really never even worry about it. Um, and I was actually just thinking this morning, I literally have no idea what the price of gas is. And that's a lovely feeling <laughs> that I don't know how much gas costs right now. Uh, I was at it's Costco and right now. Yeah, I was at yeah. Costco and I was like, I wonder how much gas costs. I really don't know. Um, uh, but but anyway, uh, the problem is if you don't have access to that, if, if you're in an apartment or in a house where you don't have immediate charging, just like some sort of plug that's sitting out there, and especially a high powered plug, like a dryer vent or something, um, cause you can do it with just a standard wall outlet, but it's really, really slow. Um, that is a big problem. And that's something that uh, this is, these are all things. I think these are valid points of concern. I think that it, you're absolutely right. I have actually been a proponent. A lot of people are like no advertising for Tesla, but I've been a proponent that they need to advertise. And I was even two years ago, I was like, it's not about your consumer today. It's about your consumer tomorrow, which is exactly what you're talking about. It's don't putting, call it advertising. Yeah. Call it education. Yeah, yeah call exactly. whatever you want. To. You just, yeah. But you got to spend money on it because there's people that don't know. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, but effectively, it, it, it is. It does cost money because however much it costs to make that in, informational thing, whatever that is, you've got to plaster it all over the place, and people have to see it 50 times before it kind of sinks into their brains, and they're like, "Oh, okay," you know. So that that's. That's something that they really, really need to do to educate. And I've seen, to their to their credit, uh, on on Tesla's YouTube channel, the, uh, they they have a lot of really good little you know snippets about hey, you can go on a road trip. Hey, you can charge up all of these things. The problem with that is that there, how many people is that reaching? It's not really reaching the average right. consumer because it's on their YouTube channel and you have to seek it out. Well, the thing about it too, the consumers that I'm talking about, the 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 ones that I ain't right. driving no robot car, those 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 type of consumers that that you need to sell to, right? There's no way in hell they're going on Tesla's Tesla's uh, right. um, main right. page, their YouTube channel. What that that would never that would never get seen by them, right? Right. Well, let's speaking of that, actually, I've been, you know, subtly drinking this, but let's talk Cybertruck. So oh, I know you have I know you have a very distinct opinion about cyber. It's fine. You, hey, look, it's a polarizing design. It looks like some sort of like doorstop. But um, but you have not had a chance to drive in one. Right. I have not either. Sadly enough, uh, I've had a chance to sit in one. I haven't had a chance to drive in one. So so what is your opinion about the Cybertruck? Do you think it's going to turn quote middle America, you know, when, when you talk about that, I know you're in North Carolina, which hardly even counts as middle America, but you know, the, the truck buying Southern, you know, good old boys sort of, it, it, are we talking about that group of people wanting to buy one of these trucks ever? Or do you think that that's just an, okay. Yeah. Go for it. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I mean, you got, you, it goes back to the education level. I mean, and two, a, a lot of people that use trucks, they, I mean, they're going to use them to work. And I know the cyber trucks got, they got good range. Um, and I know that you can work in a cyber truck and it would, it would be fine. But I mean, these good old boys, they don't, they ain't driving no robot truck. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you got, you have to get the mentality of the consumer. That's, that's, that, that's going to be able to say that EV is not a, a bad word, right? That's. There's so much of a divide, and I think it's so stupid. Now, people hear the way that I talk, and they assume that I am um, an EV hater, whatever. I am not. But that's that's what's wrong with what's going on today is because I sound like I sound and because of, uh, uh, I mean, the the way that, that I come across with, with how I talk. There's an assumption that that I hate EVs, and that's that's not the case. And, uh, and if you don't get rid of this divide and this perception from there's right. this category of people that are all EVs and there's a category of people that will never drive an EV until that goes away, um, you're going to have this massive problem in the, in the EV space because you're not going to be able to reach new consumers because they're just like, no, I don't, I don't want to hear anything. I can tell you how bad it is. If we put a video out and we title it anything EV, whatever. And now I'm just covering the car market. So I've got to cover the EV space too. Right, right. But we will lose. Like that that video will not get viewed. It will not get pushed out because people will not click on it because they're just like, oh, it's EV. I'm out. 
I don't even I don't want to I don't even want to listen to it. Did, and did that, you find that, did you find that with the F one fifty? Uh, because I think you titled that like F one fifty Lightning. Or... Oh, you didn't title no, it that way. No, oh. I didn't. I can't. I can't. Okay. If I title F one fifty Lightning, if I title it Ford can't sell EVs, which they can't, that's a true statement. But if I title it that, it will never get viewed because people just see, oh, there's EV in title. I'm out. I don't care if it. It's it's even. I could even title it in a way that's okay. EVs suck. Right. And that, that, that video, even the people who hate EVs, right. they don't they don't even want to know any more information about them. Their minds already made, they're done. That's okay. the problem that you're going to find in the in the EV market and getting out to more consumers. And I'm finding this out firsthand because of the videos that I make. And I cover the car market. EVs right. are a part of the car market. But I can't title and thumbnail something with, with EV in it. It will not get watched. Interesting. Did did you find that it ever worked for your market or did it never work? Never worked. Okay. And I've tried it so many times. I tried it so many times because it's so obvious to me that, okay, we're going to a place where EVs are getting pushed more, right? Ford, right. Stellantis, e even the big three there, they know that for their shareholders, that's the, that's the hot ticket item, right? That's how they're going to get people to invest in their stock, in their company, is by pushing right. this, this EV, and they're going to need to be in the space. So I have to cover it. So I've, I've had so many times where I've put titles and thumbnails, and I end up having to change them. And it's, you know, I don't know if you ever change titles or thumbnails. This is a little bit of uh, YouTube back in for your viewers <laughs> out there. But uh, inside, I don't know if inside ever, baseball here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ever change titles and thumbnails after you make them, but you right. can literally see automatic results of if a title is if it's a good change, if it's a bad change. So we'll we've titled something EV. Uh Ford can't sell EVs. Let's just use that example. And it it bombs. And then a couple hours later I'll change it to okay Ford can't sell their trucks, even though I'm still talking about EVs, the same video, but we'll see literally a spike in, in how many people are clicking on the video, a spike in our views. And you can't, you can't fake that kind of stuff. So it's, right. it's not what people, it's not what the, and I, I feel like my audience is more mainstream uh, than right. it is nuanced. Like I think you and, and Farzad um, go to. So, it's it, because it's more mainstream car market related. You can see what the market is saying and the market is saying, I don't want to hear about EVs anymore. Right. Well, I think this is incredibly useful because like you said, you know, my channel is, is probably pretty, uh, pretty Tesla focused and a lot of people who, who oh, educated themselves a lot. And, <laughs> and, and, and no, but they've like, there's, there's, there's a little bit of a living in an echo chamber going like, why don't right. everybody love Tesla's? They, they're the greatest car in the world, blah, blah, blah. But what you're saying and, and what your evidence, you know, it's not like you're just saying this, you have evidence that yeah. a more mainstream audience, just the average person, uh, it is just like, no, don't like EVs. Don't want EVs. Don't tell me to buy EVs. Um, uh, this, this just shows how old I am, but I remember the seatbelt issue back in the, in the seventies, I was a young, young, young kid, but I remember there were so many people like never wearing to wear a seatbelt, blah, you know, the government was like, you're wearing a seatbelt or you get a ticket. And these people are like, you know, I'm not going to wear a seatbelt or I'll die or something. And it's like, well, okay, fine. <laughs> but, you know, but it was that same sort of thing, just this obstinate, absolute hatred of it, where they were just like, this is not going to happen. Um, so it's it's really and, worth getting outside of that echo chamber and that bubble and understanding what the broader market thinks because it matters because you have to sell in Tesla and Ford and Toyota and GM and uh, you know Volkswagen and BMW they all have to sell into this market and, and so they can't and, ignore that and and people in the comments do not hear what I'm not saying I have driven <laughs> Dr. Know It All's his Model Y I loved it it was fantastic. <laughs> I like Teslas. I I I don't own one, but there's probably going to be a day at some point that I will own a Tesla right. or some EV equivalent, whatever. So I, I'm not a Tesla. Be this I am, no, it's not gonna be that one. That one's ugly. Um, but I can I can tell you just it, what I'm observing from the market, from the videos that I put out, from the titles that I put out. And the demographics are not like I'll only get people that watch my videos from Florida. A majority of my viewers are from California and New York. Majority of my viewers are California and New York, and they are tired of hearing about EVs.
Interesting. Okay. So let, let me just wrap up with this one. If you were CEO of Tesla or Ford or whatever for, for a month, you'd probably cry, but, but you know, but what would you do to let's, change let's talk about Ford? I, I, I would turn down the job. Uh, give me, <laughs> let's, let's go. <laughs> let's, okay, fine. Your Elon Musk says here, you're CEO of Tesla, you know, for the next two months, how do you turn this around? Like, what is the thing you do or what are the things you do to try to change that perception and help people to be more comfortable with EVs? Number one thing is, is education for me. Okay. That's, that's, that's my biggest thing. You, people have to know, people have to know and feel safe um, about buying and owning a Tesla and being able to own it as their only vehicle. Okay. That is the big hurdle that Tesla is going to have to get over. So I spend tons and tons of money uh, on, on education. But that's the second thing I do. The first thing I do is I take Elon's phone away from him and then we sell Twitter. We, we get out of Twitter. Twitter is a distraction for Tesla right now. And right. Tesla shareholders should be very upset with Elon right now for being distracted on his main goal. The way that they're going to make money, the way that they're going to grow um, their business, their shareholders, their stock price is if he's not distracted. And right now, Elon is distracted. Okay. I think we can leave it with that. Uh, so thank you so much. Really, I can't even believe how fast the 45 minutes went away. I was just like, wow, it was, it's already that time. Uh, thank you so much, Brandon, for being uh, on the, the 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 channel. And and really, I think this was really, really helpful. I, I tend to live in this bubble too. I just keep hearing the same things over and over again. And so I get comfortable in that. And it's really good to expand and think about it from a little bit different perspective, wider perspective. Really appreciate it. Uh, where can people find you on X? I'll put a link to your YouTube channel, of course, but I know you also have a presence on X. And even though you said Elon yeah. should quit it, you're on there. So <laughs> yeah, we, uh, I actually just started it. I, I, uh, David, David got us on there. David is, uh, he edits videos for both of us. Uh, right. But uh, just look up car question. I don't even know my handle. I'll put it's, a link. I'll put a link in the description. Yeah, just yeah. car questions answered. Uh, we're, we're on X, uh, but our, our two channels are car questions answered and um, CQA live. Uh, I do a lot of live stuff uh, and uh, talking uh, interviews just similar to what we're doing right here um cool. it's a it's a good way for us to interact with uh with our uh our viewers and i'm really excited about about, about our live channel probably even more so it's, that's more fun for me these conversations and and being right. able to talk directly to our viewers that's more exciting to me than uh than these edited videos that we do so i'm um, cool. very excited about that but uh yeah Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Maybe I'll come on your channel sometime and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about EVs and get like just flame. No, we those. can't. We can't because it won't get any views. So I, if we want to talk about EVs, I got to I got to come we over here. Talk about something I, else then. <laughs> we'll, we'll here's, talk here's about me and you will go on Farzad's channel. That's what we'll do next. There we go. We'll go on Farzad's channel. We'll talk about yeah. it. Anyway, awesome. Thank you again so much. Everybody, be sure to go and subscribe to Car Questions Answered and CQA Live and your ex-presence and all that other stuff. And a big thanks once again to Babbel for sponsoring today's video. Be sure to check out my link to get 60% off any subscription. And in the meantime, we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.